First question of the First Minister is Alan Fred Jones. Will the First Minister make a statement on the progress of discussions about reforming the Barnet formula? We have agreed on a process with the UK Government that aims to address the threat of convergence in our relative funding levels. However, full Barnet reform remains my long-term goal. Thank you very much. Plaid Cymru has argued since the establishment of the Assembly that we need a fairer formula to fund Wales, and recently you, as you've just said, have been arguing the same case and indeed making it a condition before taking income tax powers. The Labour Party did nothing when they were in government the last time. Are you in a position to tell us whether Labour, if they do come to power in Westminster following the next general election, next Westminster general election, will commit to fundamental reform of the Barnet formula, or do you agree with Owen Smith that there isn't much wrong with the formula? I don't think those were the words of Owen Smith. The issue of fair funding is something that we as a party are debating at present in order to get to a manifesto position where well, there will be a way forward, but of course it would be a help if we could um, persuade your sister party in Scotland not to oppose any changes to Barnet. Paul Davis. Uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister Jerry Holtham, of course, has made it clear in the past that perhaps we will have to adapt the, or change the way that Scotland is funded before reforming the formula in its entirety. Do you accept this? And what discussions have you had with Alex Salmond on this particular issue? Well, Alex Salmond's view, of course, is that Scotland shouldn't be part of Barnet anyway because he seeks an independent Scotland. So this isn't something that he's been eager to debate with me at present or with anyone else. But what's important is that the situation in terms of funding for all parts of the UK is resolved once the referendum has taken place in Scotland, we have a result in Scotland, because it's true today that the say that the Barnet formula cannot continue any longer. Question two, Russell George. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement regarding the provision of mental health services in Paris? Yes, I'm aware the Paris Teaching Health Board works with neighbouring LHBs to deliver high-quality mental health services for its population. Uh, thank you, First Minister. I do regularly meet with the Montgomeryshire GP cluster group to discuss issues of mutual concern. And a recurring issue which keeps emerging is the, uh, is the poor uh, level of mental health services that patients in North Paris, uh, North Paris are receiving from BCU Health Board. Now, at the meeting just before Christmas, uh, two, one GP gave me two examples of appalling incidents of out-of-care uh, that had occurred uh, that were very unacceptable. Um, GPs certainly do feel that the, the, the patients are still being put at risk uh, and due to the referral and administration's process uh, not working as they see it. Would you be prepared uh, to look at this issue in greater detail and provide these GPs with a reassurance that the government will not tolerate this level of service? I can inform the member that uh, we're aware of this. The NHS delivery unit is undertaking a review which will be completed next month. I'm aware the Health Board has arrangements in place to cover out-of-hours provision and is working to strengthen those arrangements. The review currently undertaken covers a number of areas, including the service pathway, operational working methods and the controls to support effective uh, delivery. And I know that uh, both the Powers Teaching Health Board and Betsy Cadwallada Health Board are working with the delivery unit uh, in order to implement any actions required as the review is progressing. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many believe, and I happen to agree with them, First Minister, that health care in Mid Wales has weakened since the closure of the Avathlon Ward in Bronglice Hospital and not enough preparation was made for care in the community in light of that. A review is currently being conducted by the Minister, chaired by Marcus Longley. Now, I've just received the draft objectives for that review and it doesn't mention health care particularly I will be writing back and saying well do ensure that mental health services are taken into account in this and will you support my bid in that regard well of course I'm willing to accept any request uh, from the member and I will consider that in great detail we now move to questions from the party leaders and first this afternoon is the leader of Plaid Cymru Leanne Wood Dear Llywydd 
First Minister, education is uh, in the spotlight again today with the latest Estin report. One area highlighted in that report is the lack of national support to develop leaders in our schools. Do you accept that you failed to provide adequate national leadership? Well, if you look at the report itself, it's true to say that it is not the sort of report we'd all want to see. And nevertheless, it is true to say that there are parts of the report that we can take some heart from. For example, the, uh, uh, the reports uh, that Anne Keane, uh, in talking to BBC Wales, uh, said that uh, she would hope that because of the introduction of several Welsh Government initiatives that there will be a trend of improvement in the uh, future. Uh, we've seen that more accountability has been uh, introduced and, of course, she welcomed the literacy and numeracy uh, framework. What I think has uh, not been there, as it should have been, uh, is accountability. That accountability has been strengthened, and, for example, the school improvement plans will help that. First Minister, it's been over a month now since the publication of the PISA results, and I'm sure that you've taken time to reflect. You were on record uh, acknowledging that you've taken your eye off the ball. As you seem reluctant to accept that there's been a lack of national leadership, can you tell me if you can put your finger on exactly what has gone wrong in education in this country? A fair question. I think the uh, answer is that there's been uh, a blurring of the lines of accountability uh, in terms of leadership in schools, uh, in terms of leadership in local education uh, authorities. And we as a government, of course, have to uh, accept that it's important that there's a clear way forward in the future. And I believe there is. If you look at uh, what was announced by the previous education minister and by the current education minister, you will see that there's a clear way forward in terms of uh, schools in Wales in order to see the improvements that we would all want to see. And this is being evidenced, for example, by the closing uh, of the uh, gap uh, between Wales and England with regard to GCSEs, a gap which I expect to close further in the future. You appear not to take any responsibility, First Minister, for the failings in the education system to date. You'll be aware, I'm sure, of the scathing comments from the Labour MP for Isloin yesterday, who said that he's frustrated that the Welsh Government is not addressing real bread and butter issues like education, which are concerning people day to day. Given these internal difficulties for you, First Minister, are you coming round to the view that a reduction in the number of Welsh MPs might not be a bad idea after all? <laughs> I think the two things are, are unrelated. I mean, I, I did make it quite clear. I know, she doesn't always listen to my answers, but I did make it very clear that we as a government do take some responsibility. Of course we do. And I said that in answer to, to her second question, which she seemed not to have heard. Uh, but nevertheless, it's important that responsibility is taken by local education authorities and indeed by teachers themselves, who at the end of the day are the ones delivering the, uh, the service. This has to be a joint uh, venture, uh, as it were. In terms of what is said outside of this chamber, we are very much uh, focused, of course, uh, on education. That will continue. It's why we made the pledge to uh, seek to protect school spending, as we have done. It's why, of course, we have uh, invested over the last decade in more than 140 new schools or improvements to schools. Now, uh, I was in school in the 1980s, and uh, in the 1980s, the government of the day couldn't even build a shed. We now move to the Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Archie Davis. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, I'm sure you will want to welcome the excellent news that announced uh, the growth figures for the United Kingdom today, uh, the employment figures that were announced last week as well, that showed in the last three months of last year 280,000 jobs were made across the United Kingdom, uh, of which 220,000 were full-time and 60,000 were part-time. Uh, we've spent the last two, two and a half years of of yourself and your Labour colleagues prophesizing a double dip, a triple dip, and the economic policy has been wrong of the UK government. I'm sure today you'd like to use your opportunity at First Minister's question to congratulate the Chancellor on such a record of economic stability and economic recovery. Well, of course I welcome the figures. Who, who, who couldn't? But we're just back where we were. Uh, some three or four years ago, so I don't think it's a question yet of saying that this is a, a wonderful step forward that will be sustained. Though, of course, I welcome the figures. Uh, I'm sure he will be more than happy then to congratulate the Welsh Government on the fact that the Welsh economy has done better than the UK average as a direct result of what we have done here in Wales. 
Well, First Minister, it's always the same, isn't it? You want to detract from the really good news that is happening in the overall economy, but sadly, Wales is lagging the rest of the UK in its economic performance. But let's look at what is in your competence and what you are charged with delivering. As we've heard earlier about the Estin report today, and it is a shame that the Education Minister isn't with us today to hear members' comments, because it is a damning indictment, a damning indictment on 14 years of Labour failure in education. What we have is the number of secondary schools who have gone into the unsatisfactory category going up from 14% to 23%. The number of excellent schools remain in a small minority and two-thirds of secondary schools and half of primary schools are in need of follow-up inspections. Now you started your term in the fourth assembly as being a government about delivery. Will you join your education minister in apologising for Labour's lack of delivery in education yeah, yeah, yeah. that is amplified by this report today from Estin? Well, well let's talk about the economy, shall we? Oh. Unemployment UK average. If we look at youth unemployment for those between 18 and 24, well below the UK average. Yeah. Yeah. If we look at the construction industry, well above, yeah. well above the UK average. Yeah. Uh, if we look at the number of people in work in Wales, historic high. Yeah. If we look at the level of economic inactivity, much lower, dropped at a faster rate than the rest of the UK. Yeah. So we're not, I mean, this idea that we're at the bottom of everything is quite simply factually wrong. Yeah. The reality is that our unemployment rate is not the highest in Britain. In fact, it, is, it has come down faster than anywhere else. The success of Jobs Growth Wales illustrates how well we've done in terms of youth unemployment. So, I mean, running the story that somehow Wales is uh, doing badly is, is clearly wrong. Nearly a 200% increase in foreign direct investment in the course of one year. All these things are conveniently forgotten. Let's talk about education. At last. Yes, there are, of course. Uh, issues that need to be resolved as part of this report. We recognise that. But um, his position would be stronger, uh, I believe, if it wasn't for the fact that he wants to cut education spending by 12.5%. His position would be stronger in terms of accountability if he didn't want to make every school in Wales a free school. His position would be better if he didn't want to create a situation where schools had to commission their own transport, commission their own school meals, commission their own special services, to uh, commission their own HR department or doubt to uh, pay uh, teachers and to have no accountability at all, either to their local communities or indeed to any elected bodies. Position would be stronger. And we look, of course, at what happens across the border in England where we have endless meddling. Serial meddler, a serial meddler in charge of education <laughs> and what appears to be a department that's keen to brief against its own inspectorate. So I think the situation is that, yes, we have much to do in Wales, that much is true, but we take no lessons from his party in England. Well, I hope on Saturday the Welsh team are as good at dodging the bullet and getting over the try line as you are at avoiding questions, First Minister. If you want to look at England and what the education and what the education minister has done in England, he has lifted 250,000 pupils out of poor performing education schools, and above all, he's lifted them to get better grades in the English education system. But the point that I made to you was about the Estin inspection report that was about your, your education system and the education system that your government is responsible for running here in Wales. And the damning indictment in this report and the previous report that came out last year was the lack of leadership and direction that was offered to the Welsh education system. I think it's a crying shame that you weren't prepared to apologise for the mistakes that were made and map out a bright future for Welsh education. And the people who are watching this session today will have seen the emptiness that you are offering Welsh education, First Minister. I can promise the uh, Leader of the Opposition that I don't expect to see any bullets fired on Saturday uh, on, on the pitch. Um, he is the master of the mixed metaphor, as we know. <laughs> Last week was a prime example of that, but nevertheless, he's done it again. The Estin report illustrates there are areas where there need to be improvement, but it also illustrates areas where that improvement is coming. He, he mentions England. How many schools have been built in England? The first thing that the government did there was to stop the school building programme. Yeah. The first thing they did. When I was in school in the 1980s, as someone actually went to a comprehensive school and whose children were in a comprehensive school, I can say that nothing was invested in schools in Wales in the 80s. Absolutely nothing. I sat in classrooms with broken windows, I sat in classrooms with ivy growing up the inside of the wall. 
because the government uh, that uh, ran the country in his party at that time spent absolutely no money at all. Why? Because they didn't have children in the comprehensive system. That's the reason for it. Yes, we will learn the lessons from this report. That much is true. But we are not at least in a situation where money has been diverted away from building new schools in order to pay for the free schools policy. Mm. That's what's happened in England. That's where the money went. Money taken away from the most needy to pay for the few. That's what they did. If you look at the situation in England, we also see a situation where we have the inspectorate and the department at war with each other. That's what we see in England. And, of course, the Secretary of State who cannot help but meddle on a weekly basis in the curriculum. Accountability is important. We will move forward in Wales as we see the shambles being generated in England. And finally, leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, Kirsty Williams. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister, in 2011, following that year's disappointing Estin annual report, you told us we would have to wait for your education minister's speech to find out the solutions to the Welsh education problem. In 2012, following another disappointing Estin report, you said, next year, I expect to see improvement. But actually, in 2013's Estin annual report, the proportion of schools awarded good or excellent judgments was even lower than the previous year. And today, in our report today, Eston report that the number of secondary schools rated as unsatisfactory has almost doubled. First Minister, after four years of asking you, following the publication of disappointing Eston annual reports, could you give me a straight answer today? When will we see and when will Welsh people see the improvements your government continually promise but don't deliver? Well, I would argue that those improvements are already showing signs of being identified, although not enough as yet. Firstly, the number of schools that have been built. I've been to a number of schools in the past four years that are brand new, brand new comprehensives, yeah. which were never built for many, many years in the 80s and 90s in Wales. Never built. So I've seen that. I have seen good examples in schools in Wales of schools that are doing very well. What is lacking is consistency. There's no question about that. And so what we will look to be doing in the, as part of the school improvement plan is making sure that heads are supported where there's a question of a leadership, where departments in schools are supported by bringing in teachers from good performing schools in order to turn those departments around. And that I believe is the way to see improvement in the future. We are beginning to see signs of that improvement, and I illustrate the example, of course, that I gave earlier on, namely that the gap that is there in GCSE attainment with England is narrowing. First Minister, I don't know which bit of the doubling of unsatisfactory scores doesn't alarm you. You and your education ministers, both past and present, continually tell us that the key policy to drive up standards is through the creation of the regional consortia. Yet, if you read the Eston report today, they say that in more, that more than half of the local authorities that have been inspected, that regional consortia are failing to deliver an improvement of standards. You've placed everything on the creation of those consortia. When will that approach start to benefit all Welsh pupils? Well, this is tied in with the later debate on the Williams Commission and the stance that her party will take with regard to the Williams Commission. The Williams Commission has made very strong recommendations in terms of what the future should be in terms of public service delivery in Wales. And I look forward to hearing what she says about that and indeed about education as part of that debate, uh, which she has not done so far. Nevertheless, I reiterate the point that I made earlier that we are seeing signs of improvement. It is far from the case that, that improvement is satisfactory as yet. And where there are schools that are rated as unsatisfactory, they will receive assistance to make sure that they are turned around. And the Education Minister will be making an announcement in the very near future in terms of a plan on how to do that. So I'm not quite sure if the First Minister understands what the regional consortia are. They are the gathering together of those local authorities to overcome the disadvantages of having small education authorities. And it's not working. I'm not saying that. The inspector is saying it. The approach you're taking is not to delivering the improvements that you promised. Now, last week, I asked you about your decision to ditch the health targets that were contained in your programme for government. But let's have a look at the education targets in your programme for government. 
Actually, attendance in primary and secondary schools is down on last year. The percentage of secondary schools inspected graded as good or excellent has flatlined at 45% when you said they would improve. And there are no excellent standards in further education, adult or community learning, nor in local authorities. Now that it is clear that you're not meeting your education targets, do you intend to ditch those two? No, I never said that, uh, that we would. But what is clear uh, is that there is a need to examine the way in which education is delivered, which she seems to indicate herself, which is why I look forward to seeing what she has to say later on this afternoon. Because at the end of the day, it's not the Welsh Government that delivers. It sets the framework and it provides funding. That's true. The delivery is done by local education authorities and by schools and teachers. And so, in terms of ensuring better delivery in the future, it's important that teachers are part of that delivery, of course. It's important that local education authorities are part of that delivery, or in the case of the Conservatives, not part of it at all. Mm. Uh, the schools doing it all themselves. And then we can see the improvement that we, be we have begun to see, to see an improvement that is, that is far from what we would want to see as yet. That much is true. But to see that improvement continue in the future. We now move to back to questions on the paper, and it's question three, William Powell. Jochen Bauer, Sowith. Will the First Minister please make a statement on the duty of local health boards to communicate with the public? Well, all NHS organisations in Wales have a duty to communicate and engage effectively with the public. I'd like to thank the First Minister very much for that response. Just this lunchtime, uh, uh, together with uh, Petitions Committee colleagues, I received a petition of some 11,000 uh, signatures from Cardigan Hospital. And... Uh, the uh, petitioners raised with me severe concerns regarding the quality uh, and the transparency of communications that they have with the Hawaldar Health Board. In addition to that, I've also heard uh, that there are significant problems uh, with the communication between the Health Board and Aberystwyth University, notably around mental health issues. First Minister, do you agree with me that it's necessary for Hawaldar Health Board to raise its game in these matters and to communicate effectively with the public that it serves. Well, I can say to the member that the Minister has made clear that he expects to see more positive engagement and communication by the Health Board with the local population, and he has asked the Welsh NHS Confederation to assist the Health Board in helping it to rebuild its relationship with local communities. So we are aware of the issue, and that work will be ongoing in order to rebuild the trust that should exist between the Board and the community that it serves. Darren Miller. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, it's not just the whole Bar University the Health Board that's had problems with communicating with the public. The same has also been the case in North Wales, where the Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board, of course, announced a temporary suspension of elective non-urgent surgery uh, last week, didn't communicate that effectively in, to individual uh, patients within a reasonable uh, timescale. Can you tell us whether your government will be issuing guidance to local health boards to improve the way in which they are able to communicate with patients where uh, operations might have to be postponed or cancelled, sometimes for very necessary reasons? It can be, of course, uh, a matter of notice. It's difficult to let people know sometimes in good time when things have to be changed at short notice, although, of course, the situation now uh, has been uh, reversed. I will ask the Health Minister to write to you formally on this uh, in terms of what guidance is already available. Ellen Jones. Well, Madam Look, thank you. Well, it's clear that the Hoelva Health Board haven't listened to what the Health Minister had to say to them about improving communication because 11,000 people signed a petition against the closure of beds in Cardigan and a bus full of people from Cardigan came here to present the petition today. The Hawaldar Health Board did announce the closure of all beds in Cardigan Hospital without any kind of consultation with the community, although it was a requirement on them to do so under Welsh Government guidelines. Will you look into the fact that the Hawaldar Health Board chose not to consult with the local community when making such a significant change as withdrawing all beds from that hospital? Well... I'd just like to say, of course, on that, that the Health Board have said that no beds will be lost to the county. It's important to emphasise that. And also, of course, as I said earlier, work is ongoing at present to ensure that the Health Board improves the communications, their communications. Will the First Minister make a statement on asbestos in schools? Presiding officer, I understand that you've granted permission for questions 4 and 10 to be grouped. 
and therefore I recognise the serious nature of asbestos in schools, particularly as regards the safety of pupils and teachers. The Health and Safety Executive regu is regulating and uh, monitoring the compliance, and under the regulation regime, local authorities are required to undertake asbestos surveys on schools and implement an asbestos management system. Thank you for that response, First Minister. I've seen a great deal of correspondence that does demonstrate that there is lack of, lack of clarity in terms of who is responsible for the management of asbestos in Welsh schools. David Laws at Westminster level says that the Welsh Government is responsible and the Welsh Government states that the Westminster Government is responsible. Can you give us more information today as to who exactly is responsible so that we can tackle this very serious situation in Welsh schools? The responsibility lies with the Health and Safety Executive, that's quite clear, as regards ensuring that things happen uh, quickly. That's a responsibility of the local authorities and the local environmental health officers. And also there is some responsibility which falls on the schools themselves because if they have to dispose of the asbestos, that has to be done properly and safely. Guidelines will be published before long, which includes the details of the responsibilities and duties of those who should dispose of and manage any asbestos, but the responsibility lies primarily with the health and safety executive and of course we ensure that that is also a matter for the environmental health officers. First Minister, this conflict between health and safety and management within schools has been going on now for a number of months. New guidance has or is about to be published in England following the report by a, rep a committee on cancer in Westminster. Do you know when the Welsh Education Department will publish new guidance, bearing in mind that some local authorities haven't carried out these surveys that you mentioned for up to 10 years? Well, as I said, th those guidelines will be published imminently, and I have made it clear uh, who is who has the responsibility for uh, safety in the schools and the monitoring of that and who is responsible. First Minister, we've uh, come a long way since the realisation that asbestos is responsible for a number of very horrible in illnesses including asbestosis and mesothelioma. Uh, we've also moved on now from the idea that it's completely safe to leave asbestos in situ, particularly in pub public buildings such as schools. Alid Roberts mentioned uh, the, committee, uh, the, the committee in England, uh, in the wake of which now the education uh, department has decided that it is unsafe uh, and unsustainable to leave asbestos uh, in buildings such as schools. I've heard what you've had to say, uh, and I think to a lot of people out there it would very much sound like passing the buck. I don't really care whose responsibility this is, but I think you as First Minister have a duty, and your Health Minister and your Education Minister have a duty to really make sure that we make our schools as safe as they possibly can be. That isn't happening at the moment. Please, please give us and parents out there a timeline by, ti by the end of which schools will be, uh, you can assure that people at schools are completely safe. Yeah. Well, we, we can give an assurance now that schools are safe because we know that asbestos is safer if it is undisturbed. Uh, so, simply removing the asbestos uh, with the enormous cost that comes with that uh, would not make financial sense. But rather than just the financial sense, there's another issue here. It is often safer to leave undamaged asbestos in situ, it's not. subject to a regular assessment, rather than creating additional fibre or dust disturbance to its removal. That's the old that has been the reality mm. for many, New many evidence. years. And that is not my understanding, in, uh, the situation he has described is not my understanding in terms of the guidance that is coming from the Health and Safety Executive. Mohammed Ashka. Thank you, Madam Presiding Officer. First Minister, I welcome the news that the Kumkan High School recently reopened its door to people after work to remove asbestos. However, I am concerned that the, although the school closed in October 2012, but the work to remove the asbestos did not commence until June 2013. Does the minister agree with me 
that the work to remove asbestos when discovered in schools should commence without delay to, make, to minimize the disruption to those people, parents and staff affected. And could, could he kindly tell the chamber what was the reason for this long delay? Well, it's not our doing, of course, sir. This is not a matter for the Welsh Government. Uh, that's a matter for the authorities on the ground. I don't know why it took uh, that long to uh, begin work. There may have been good reasons for it in terms of making sure uh, that conditions were safe for workers to go in to remove the asbestos. We, we, we are not aware of it. But it's not, it's not the Welsh Government's role uh, to uh, ensure that this work is done. It's the role of those authorities on the ground. Uh, Cwm Carn, of course, originally was a GMS school. Question five, Susie Davis. Um, will the First Minister provide an update on the review of the individual patient funding request process, please? Well, the preliminary work on the review is nearly finished. Officials have met with all the local panels and will meet with patient groups tomorrow. The feedback from these meetings will inform the review group's work when they meet on the 31st of January. Um, well, thank you for that, uh, First Minister. With so many reviews of so many aspects of the health service currently underway, I didn't really want this one to get lost. Uh, now, we brought evidence before you, of course, so that uh, women with certain breast cancers are likely to be losing out as a result of the existing review. But if you remain politically motivated to resist a cancer treatment fund, can you tell us exactly when we might actually get a, a full timetable from you, rather than just the preliminary announcement you've made today? Well, I, I've given the uh, timetable. The group will report by the end of March 2014. It's for the Minister then to uh, make a decision. But yes, what we don't want, of course, is a cancer drugs fund that prevents people from getting funding. Uh, which is what, of course, is happening in England. We know that the IPFR system is far, far better at reviewing uh, requests such as this successfully. The Cancer Drugs Fund in England turns down the vast majority of the requests that it gets. So, no, we don't, it's not politically motivated. We don't want to disadvantage people in Wales, as I'm afraid the Tories have done to people in England. Uh, well, first of all, this may be a question that people uh, don't want to ask, but I think it's important. Uh, where patients are not judged to be eligible for life-saving treatments on the NHS, what efforts can the Welsh Government make to deter doctors from charging patients privately for extremely expensive treatments that often do little more than raise false hopes for recovery or an extended lifespan? There are issues there uh, of professional ethics, there's no doubt about that. You'll have heard, of course, the Health Minister in the last week or two talk about the need to eliminate treatment that uh, sometimes serves no purpose or sometimes makes things worse. And that, I think, is an absolutely correct message to, uh, to give. Uh, any uh, competent surgeon or doctor should be ensuring that uh, treatment is available on the NHS. No competent or honest doctor should divert patients to private treatment that is not required. Peter Black. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, in addition to the very important issues raised by Susie Davis and Lindsay Whittle, I've had experience through my constituents who have applied for um, met, met drugs in this, in this particular way, have been turned down. But because the, um, the, the health board do not directly inform the patient, but actually go to the consultant, and sometimes the consultant does not pass on that message to the patient, by the time the patient finds out they've been turned down, the period by which they can appeal that decision has, has been passed. Could I ask you, when you're reviewing the, the current um, situation, yeah. that you have a look at this to make sure that patients are aware of decisions mm -hmm. in a timely manner and are able to put an appeal in within the, the prescribed period? Well, consultants should be doing that. Uh, and one thing I should emphasise is, it's, it is there is a duty on consultants to make sure the applications that are made are made properly and fully by the consultants. A letter is, is not good enough. And I know of circumstances where a simple letter has been sent without any supporting information. That isn't helping patients. It's important that consultants get this right as well. Uh, nevertheless, where circumstances change, my understanding is that people are able to reapply uh, in any event, and it certainly wouldn't be right, of course, uh, for people to lose the ability to uh, go through the system as they should because the information has not been passed on to them by their own doctors. That is a duty, I think, that, is, that, is, uh, uh, that rests on the shoulders of consultants who made the application in the first place. Question six, Jonathan Saunders. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on orthopaedic surfaces in North Wales? Yes, with £13.5 million of additional funding provided by us, there has been uh, a great improvement over the past three years. First Minister, what you failed to mention is the fact that many of the specialist and complex services provided by Gaboin Hospital have now been repatriated back to consultants within North Wales. And it's fair to say that concerns have been raised with me by GPs because 
what's happening now, there's a triage, three-phase system, that a patient struggling with a complex revision or a specialist orthopaedic need for treatment actually then waits several months to go to a consultant who can't actually carry out that treatment. They're then back to square one as they're then referred by the consultant to Gaboin. First Minister, my constituents have asked me to ask you, what steps are you taking to ensure that those patients in North Wales who do require the more complex and specialist orthopaedic treatment that is only available at Gaboin Hospital, um, that can access these specialised services without quickly, without unnecessary, costly and bureaucratic delays. Well, the situation that uh, the member has described on the face of it, it seems senseless, of course. Uh, no one could defend it. If she uh, could uh, provide me with further details, I'll be more than happy to investigate the situation. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, are you confident that Better Oral Health Board will not have to delay treatments again this year as they did last week and that they have the necessary capacity to deal with the winter pressures when the winter arrives? I am confident that they can deal with the winter pressures and I'm very confident that they can deal with uh, accidents. Sometimes, of course, there is such a great demand for services that some surgery has to be deferred or postponed for a short period of time, but I'm pleased to see that everything has reverted to the previous system, but I'm very confident that they can deal with accidents, and that's exactly what they did. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, will you outline the Welsh Government's position on UK membership of the European Union? Well, the UK's membership of the EU is essential to the prosperity of both the UK and Wales. We know that uh, Wales benefits in many fundamental ways, including through programmes such as the structural funds and the common agricultural policy, without which our farmers could not function or operate. And our trade and foreign investment prospects are enhanced by our membership through unfettered access to the single market. Uh, thank you. A recent study has shown that more than 120,000 jobs in Wales, and 4,000 of these are in my Delling constituency, are dependent on the EU, and, and the chief executive Airbus, has, which employs 6,000 people in Flintshire, has said Europe is key to its continued success. Will you further press the Conservative-led Westminster government to listen to industry leaders like Airbus in the hope they will stop behaving like UKIP plus one, a policy which will put jobs in Wales at risk? Well, the, the approach that we uh, take to the UK's membership of the EU is not one of blinkered nationalism, which I'm afraid uh, exists on the benches opposite, not everyone in fairness, but certainly with regard to UKIP as well. The reality is the Welsh economy uh, would not function properly without membership of the EU. Why? Because there are so many companies here, Airbus is one, who are only in Wales because Wales is, through its membership of the UK, a member of the EU. It wouldn't be here otherwise. Why on earth would they, would they bother coming to the UK when they could relocate or locate uh, their uh, factories within the much larger European market, which is far larger than the UK on its own. Now, I've never understood this argument that somehow uh, Wales or Britain would be better off outside the EU. Uh, reducing your ability to access one of the world's largest markets for a country with a proud history of trading seems to me to be utterly insane. Well, the Chief Executive of Airbus has clarified um, his comments and made it very clear that um, jobs in the UK are not dependent on um, the Britain's membership of the EU, and I'm very happy to pass that on to the First Minister should he require that clarification, and indeed to my colleague Sandy Mewis. First Minister, isn't it right that the people of Wales should be given their opportunity to vote and have their say on the membership? of the European Union where uh, constituents from across Wales can express their views and decide whether or not they wish to be members of the European Union or not. And they are perfectly able to assess, uh, uh, make their own assessments as to the benefits of Wales's membership of the European Union. I do wonder sometimes whether the members in the right party. Uh, but if people wish to have a referendum, of course, on uh, uh, on, the, on Britain's membership of the European Union, they can vote for UKIP. That's the whole point. If people wish to have a referendum on Wales's membership of the UK, they can, they can vote for Plaid Cymru. That's, at the end of the day, that's what Plaid Cymru stands for. The country's a democracy, and uh, if that's what people wish, they can, uh, they can do so. But the reality is this. Britain on its own is simply not big enough to attract investment. It is absolutely dependent on its membership of the EU. Our farmers, our farmers would go bust without access to the European market. They would go bust. There's no question about that. They would not be able to compete in the face of tariffs that would be erected against them 
by the, what would then be the European Union, they would still have to abide by European rules. You still have to abide by European rules. You end up like Norway, where you have no control over the regulations that are created in Europe, but you still have to abide by them if you want to sell into the European market. The reality is the party opposite is driven by a narrow-minded, blinkered nationalism. That's all it is. Their concern is what is good for London, not what's good for Wales. Roger Dean Thomas. First Minister, I very much welcome your comments regarding the advantages to Wales of being within the European Union and, in fact, the advantages to the United Kingdom of being a member state of the European Union. But what are you going to do to ensure that the people of Wales are aware of these advantages? Because if there was a referendum and there's a possibility that the UK citizens would vote for withdrawal from the EU and the implications for Wales would be huge. What are you as a government in Wales going to do to ensure that the people of Wales are aware of the evident benefits of being a member of the United EU? Well, I have endeavoured to ensure that people do understand that. The debate will be interesting over the next few years and the member will be aware of this, but £1.9 billion has come from Europe through the structural funds. That funding wouldn't be available to Wales without those funds. And I don't believe for one minute that that money would be kindly donated by the Chancellor in London. He would just keep all of those funds to himself. Without membership of the European Union, there is no future for farming in Wales because of the CAP payments and also the fact that farmers in Wales do have access to the major market, namely the European market. That's not to say that everything is perfect with the Commission or the structure. No one is saying that. But for me, withdrawing from one of the largest markets in the world would be foolish indeed. Question 8, Julie Morgan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, what is the Welsh Government doing to increase the presence of international organisations in well, Wales? We, we continue our efforts to increase the presence of international organisations in Wales, including increased inward investment from international companies. Um, I thank the First Minister for that reply. Um, would the First Minister be able to provide an update on the joint bid with Cardiff Council to host the International Cricket Council in Cardiff? Well, we understand that Cardiff is on the shortlist of four. Uh, the project would be expected to create 70 jobs. We don't know yet when a decision will be made on the, uh, on the bids, but we have worked with Glamorgan and indeed with the City Council uh, and have supported the joint bid to the ICC. Susie Davis. So, with uh, First Minister, the presence of international organisations, particularly international businesses, are very welcome, is very welcome in Wales. Uh, while we're happy to see 67 firms coming to Wales this year, that's still only 4% of the inward investment for the whole of the UK, uh, and considerably less than the 15% that Wales enjoyed when Labour took on a devolved government um, at, at the beginning of devolution. As Welsh Government has now considered aftercare strategy to turn these green routes into permanent routes, uh, will your Government be adopting the Welsh Conservatives' ideas set out in our Destination Cymru uh, document, which I'm sure you've had an opportunity to see? We spend a lot of time selling Wales abroad and at home, getting investment into Wales as the figures show, bringing jobs into Wales. What the Tories want to do is set up a council. That is their answer to, to all this. In terms of aftercare, does she not know of the anchor companies? Do you not know that? That's been personal too. Clearly not. Otherwise, they're just trying to take one of our ideas. And to hark back to the uh, days when Wales took 15% of investment, there was a reason for that. The WDA sold Wales on the basis, come to Wales because people will accept less money than anywhere else. That's where the jobs came. And guess what? They all went uh, when all those companies went somewhere else where it was even cheaper. So let's not pretend that it took some effort to do that. At the end of the day, it was simply a question of come and, come and uh, employ these people because they're willing to work on the cheap. Well, I'm not prepared for people in Wales to work on the cheap as the Tories wanted them to do in the 80s and 90s, and they destroyed our coal and steel industries, which is what they did. We are looking at good quality jobs for the people of Wales, jobs that rely on skills, jobs that are sustainable in the future, not jobs that are here today, gone tomorrow, which is exactly what the Tories created. Jocelyn Davis. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, first Minister, I'm sure you'd uh, uh, agree that maintaining... Shh. 
Maintaining links with other governments is also important, especially in terms of trade and the wider economic cooperation at that international level. Sadly, we've seen in recent years anyway a decline here in the presence of other governments, especially consuls. Have you had any discussions on reversing this trend and what are you doing to encourage the presence of other governments here? I've had many discussions on reversing this trend. I've spoken to a number of ambassadors. Uh, we have more honorary consuls than ever before, but I'd like to see more, well, I'd like to see full-time consuls uh, return to Wales. The Irish consulate, of course, was closed for financial reasons at that time. We will continue to make representations uh, to foreign governments to open a consulate in Cardiff. One of the problems is that there is a reciprocal agreement between different governments that limit the number of consulates that can be opened in any one country. So, for example, if we wished to have a Chinese consulate in Wales, there'd have to be agreement for an extra British consulate in China, and that sometimes limits the scope that we have. But, yeah, certainly we want to see uh, the establishment of a number of full-time consulates in Wales in the future, and I've had a number of discussions, ongoing discussions, with uh, various governments with regard to establishing them. Thank you, First Minister. We now